Good afternoon. My name is Gail McPherson and I'm a professor in events and cultural policy and the director of the Centre for Culture, Sport and Events at the University of the West of Scotland. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your Convene, Challenge and Connect webinar series. Today I'm going to talk with you about monitoring and evaluation of events, programmes and projects linked to sport and cultural events and festivals. I look forward to meeting up with you in the question and answer series a bit later in, in September. So without further ado, I'll just take you through it. So what I'd like to cover today is often these are quite scary topics in terms of monitoring evaluation. And we ask culture, cultural creatives and artists and people who run community events to monitor and evaluate their event, to justify funding or to justify resource or space in the, in the community or facility. And that can often be a bit daunting. So I would like to break that down a bit for you today so that it's much more simple and can show you that it's, it's more manageable. And when you need to call in the experts, if you're really looking for a big economic economic impact study. Um, so today we're gonna to cover what we mean by monitoring and evaluation. I'm going to take you through a logic model for evaluation that we've used many times with others for people like um, Spirit of London 2012, with the British Council, it's often used with them, with the DCMS, with others. Then sometimes you'll hear them talk about a theory of change, especially in arts and cultural programmes when they're looking for that. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And then I'm going to give you an example of the six dimensions of social value. This was based on a project that we did for Spirit of London 2012 and Local Trust, where they wanted to look more in depth at what, how, how do we define social value? How do we measure it? How do we monitor it? What can we show the results within the community? So I'll take you through that. It's a really useful guide. And then at the end, I've given you some tools and resources, and I'll also uh, provide a bit more from that if, if anyone needs it. So right to the very basics, what do we mean by monitoring and evaluation when someone asks us to do that? In a sense for me, I always ask people the question, what does success look like for you? So one of my roles that I played was part of the big team for City of Culture for Paisley for the City of Culture 2021. And one of the things that we started with right at the start was what does success look like? Is it actually about winning this title? Is it about what we do in the communities? Is it about making change? Is it about how culture can create participation, engagement, um, alleviate poverty, reduce isolation? These are all big things that we expect from a programme. And that was a programme of change through a city of culture bid. Bring that down to much smaller programmes and events where perhaps like Birmingham Commonwealth Games 2022, there's a cultural festival alongside it. So what does success look in that festival? Do we have um, themes for the festival? Are you looking at monitoring evaluation of the branding of the media, of participation of local people, of tourists? Are you showcasing what Birmingham has to offer to the world? Is this about putting yourself on an international stage? And we can sit back and say, oh gosh, maybe maybe all of those things at different stages, depending on the size and scale of the event that you're doing. So how do you determine what success looks like? And we spent many days doing this um, in Paisley. We looked at this a lot. Previous to that, I've been involved in previous Commonwealth Games bid for Glasgow, for example. Again, looking what would success look like. These are all things that you ask. So one of the things that we try to get you to look at is spend enough time on what success means. Does this mean on a local level, just members of the community participating who hadn't before? Does it mean involving um, increasing and growing audiences? for uh, cultural offerings that you have locally that perhaps you haven't reached in the past? And how do, you, how do you know when that has been a success? So in the most basic terms, we're going to compare what was planned and what was achieved. And then you need some tools to do that. So if you plan to have, to grow your audiences and you say that you're going to grow your audiences by 10% or 20% or you're going to have X number of people who have never participated in the arts or culture before coming along, how do you see it? And 
if that if you also have targets like we want to increase participation reduce loneliness um create trust all of these things these these are what we tend to talk about in terms of social values and i'll spend a bit more time looking at them a bit later one of the things then to if, if you're really looking at a large scale event is to take guides that are already there there's no point in reinventing the wheel so um, event scotland have uh, an event impact toolkit and we now have an event britain as well so they're very um, strong on when you bid for funding to these organisations. If you are bidding for funding to evaluate and um, to run an event, for example, or to, to receive funding to put on a large scale event, then they will ask you to use their event impact toolkit. And the event impact toolkit covers four broad areas of they absolutely want to see economic. And by that, they are looking for you to show a return on investment. So generally, that tends to be around the seven or eight to one level of for every pound they put in, they would like to see seven or eight pound coming back into the economy. And a lot of um, funding organisations, quite rightly, will be concerned about the economic impact to that um, city or county, for example. So these are something that you, if you're running a, a large scale um, festival or event that you would have to engage and you may have to engage others to help you with that. On a more smaller scale, that may not be such a, a concern for you. Um, and it may be some of the more environmental or the social and cultural impacts. And in this toolkit that I've given you the details for there and you can Google, you will get a link to each and every one of those. So for example, in media, if you are using social media to promote your event, have you set up the analytics for that in the first place? Do you know how to analyze that? Are you going to be able to, to, to set up something that will scrape all the data for you? Have you established that you will use one hashtag only? So many events that I see, we have two hashtags, we have three, we have four different, different hashtags go out and, and maybe because sometimes they're sporting and cultural, there may be two hashtags. That would be the maximum, I would say. How are you going to scrape that data? How are you going to analyze it? How are you going to know the reach? And I don't just mean by the Google Analytics. You really need to know much more detail than that. Than you, and there are tools that you can set that up. Things like um, the branding for your event. Your sponsors will be interested in the branding. They'll be interested in how you've promoted it locally. And again, that, that will come down to even a local sponsor. Increasingly, people are wanting to say, well, what am I getting for my money if I sponsor you, even for a local community festival? And if you're able to say, well, I will look at the branding, I will look at our social media reach um, how, and how far, and not just about the reach, but the actual engagement with the brand, or and, and then you devise a strategy for that. So each of these would have their own strategies, and that may be well beyond some small to medium sized events. Increasingly, we're seeing uh, environmental and sustainability as key issues in climate change, especially with young people. And, you know, what could be worse than events? We, we ask people to travel to events. It, it doesn't make them being environmentally friendly very easily. But we can do that. We can reduce food miles. We can have only local produce at our local event, we can have only glass bottles, we can have wristbands that I mean you pay a deposit and you get money back if you if you use environmentally um, sound products. It means that if you reduce waste and you ask everybody to take it home, for example, these are all things that you could be looking at. Again, this will change depending on whether you're doing a small scale or a large scale event. And I've not seen so much about the social and cultural because we're going to look at social value um, in a bit more detail there. But this is all before you even start to run your event or your programme or your festival, you're starting to think this will all be in the pre-planning stages to what does success look like in each of these, not just have I got enough people to come to the event and tickets, tickets on the door or or if the event's free, people through the door and, and at the end of it, you say, well, I think everybody had a good time. But what did that good time lead to? And is that enough? Is it enough for your event just to be happy? And, and if, it's, if it's a free event, if it doesn't require much funding, that may be enough. But then there are stages that you have to go through. And for most of you that have been involved in the Birmingham 
2022 cultural festival, I think you're going to need a bit more beyond just some of the basics. So moving on to thinking about logic models, I, the, my next slide is going to take you and show you an example of a logic model, but sometimes logic models can be quite daunting again for people. And so I wanted to take you through just a, a very basic way of looking at it on either side of that and say there are four steps to evaluating your event. And if you do these four steps in order, then you're you're halfway there. You're, you're on the, the, the planning stage. And at a very basic level, it is about thinking about the, um, what you're going to do. Sometimes I refer to it as a roadmap. Where's the roadmap that you're going? And again, we talk about this on much bigger projects like for the British Council when they're looking at um, cultural protection or cultural programming. How do they know that they've achieved what they set out to achieve? And we sometimes talk about it as a theory of change. And if you start off saying, well, I would really like this event to be much more multi-ethnic. I would like everybody in the community to come together. I would like it to reduce loneliness and you know, all of these things and really for people to, to work together in the community in harmony. Okay, right, they're pretty big asks. So they're good and they're admirable. So how are you going to evaluate them? How are you going to bring them together? So the first stage, of course, is determining what you want to achieve for your event. Sometimes people have lots of aims, lots of objectives, and it's not possible. And they start small, grow big. You, often you see that some of the success in events have come from small, sm small scale community events that have grown and they've grown in identity. They've attracted more people and they've been able to move from a small scale event to a medium size to su suddenly they're an internationally renowned uh, event and festival. Sometimes they may have even been something that was in protest to something else. So, um, you know, if you, uh, some of the sort of big music events in, in America, for example, might have been um, in protest and they say, well, we don't want this overly commercialized event. And then suddenly they've become overly commercialized as the years have gone down because there's no other way of managing the festival and everybody coming in. So alternative <laughs> models don't always end up staying the alternative models. You end up saying, well, we actually need some of the standard toolkits to, to know how we want to even change an event or where we go with that. So we've done that first stage. You determine your objectives, what you want to achieve, and then you decide what you want to find out from your evaluation. Before we start, how are we going to find this out? What, do, what is it we want to know from people about participation or engagement? Um, or audiences, for example. Do you ever ask your audience what they thought about beyond, um, did you enjoy yourself tonight? And, and that's important, but there, there may be some more to that. Identifying what evidence you need, whether you have the skill set for that. Do you have to um, bring in a plan? Do you have to try to seek other members of your group or community to bring that together and or your organization? When do you know that you have a skill set, but there are times that you want to buy in for that? Um, so one, for example, if we talk, look back to the event impacts toolkit, they talk about how we measure, how we monitor, um, and how we manage the impact of events. Because impact of events are, can be both positive and negative, so we have to manage all of these. And if you're still on a very basic level looking at an economic return, and that might just be getting your money back from community level events. So I'm sure you could do the evaluation in-house then. We can, you can set up a basic questionnaires and qualitative approaches. So we talk about quantitative approaches, which would be a questionnaire for asking people what they thought generally on a tick box basis. And it gives you data that you can turn into a report. Qualitative Data tends to be a bit harder to determine people because they're not quite sure how to sometimes do that as systematically. So that's why we often hear the language of we will measure X or we'll measure Y. And if you then look to the qualitative approaches, it tends to be more about participation, enjoyment, feelings, and how that how the event made you feel and things like that. So that maybe requires a bit more of a skill set because sometimes that requires your volunteers to be able to engage with people and speak to people on the day 
with generally a set of guides or questions that they can ask people about their engagement and, uh, and their experience of the event. If you're taking that a stage up where it's a, you know, it's a maybe a public sector event or a mixture of public and private sector event, but it's a it, it's a bit bigger and that you do need to give a, a clear report and detailed report to your funders, then you will we talk about that as an intermediate level research skills that needed. Again, depending on the company and the organization, if you're an established um, arts or sports organization, you may already have those skills in there to do that. Where it moves to an advanced level of measurement and monitoring is when you need to actually show an economic impact assessment. And that would be required from the likes of Event Scotland if they've given you, or Event Britain if they've given you uh, a large scale, a, a large amount of money to, to help run an event or a festival. Or for example, if depending on the scale of the funding that you maybe have got through a festival program, um, through something like Birmingham, cultural festival for the uh, 2022 games. At that stage, you probably are looking to possibly connect or, or work with um, experts in that. And there's plenty of experts and consultants who will do this for you and be able to set it up. There are times when you just need to know that this is what I need to do to go out with um, so that we can focus on the things that you're good at in terms of delivering, whether it's the art program or creatives. I often get asked by people saying, well, I'm a, I'm a creative entrepreneur or I'm an artist or I actually don't know how to do all this evaluation, but actually I've got a significant amount of money um, and I need to, you know, that might be hundreds of thousands and uh, to, to envisage and, and put on my idea and put this event on. But yes, I do want to understand what impact that had on the community and whether that led to something else. So, for example, at London 2012, we we conducted um, a cultural Olympiad. We conducted an evaluation of the cultural Olympiad based on a set of themes, and that themes were on you know, reach, participation, engagement, and then we looked at the various amount of cultural projects that were funded and how they'd achieved that and how they'd set themselves up to achieve that. We, Perhaps some of the things that may be important are that you create new networks, that you create partnerships. How do you how do you judge what you've done on that? How do you say the network came about? I might have known some of these people already, but what happened was through this project, it led me to bidding for a new project with one of those partners or, or somebody in that network. And that impact may not be realized for two years down the road, but once that has been realized and you have developed new skill set as well from running these cultural festivals or or your project then later on you're able to say actually the impact was far greater than just an economic impact to the town or city but also you as an artist and the sector in terms of excellence and cultural excellence and then the reach of that isn't just about branding and media reach, the reach is about the artistic talent going perhaps to na uh, national level events or international level partnerships and events. And most of our funders are interested in that and our UK government are interested in that because these type of things increase our soft power, increase our ability to sell our artists internationally and increase that perhaps exchange relationship with people and other countries that you can connect with. Anyway, these are huge asks of, of looking at how you were going to evaluate your event from you starting with you know, local people coming to international partnerships, but it's the same template. And that's why I've got you looking at this here to say, this is the exact same template. So on a more basic level, then how do we start it is, so that's going slightly, um, off, but I'll, I'll move that so that you can see it a bit better. It's what do we want to achieve? What are the aims? So that first column is the aims and what, it, what are factors that are external to us? What's our starting point? What's the baseline? Do we have any baseline data already? And what's the potential um, for our potential audiences? So if you look, this will take you through um, the 
the, this is the standard approach to what we would call um, a, a logic model. And each of these templates here, each of these columns will be about what you need to ask yourself is. And some of this is about input, it's about output, it's about outcomes, it's about the activities. So this third column here that I'm looking at is, what do you need to put in to get the, the achievement that you want? Um, what type of activities required to bring the audiences and participants that you're seeking? And how will you know what the take up will be? Is it all ticketed? Is it something that's online? Can you monitor that? And how will you know if the, the activity that you're doing is aimed at the right person uh, or the right level, for example, as well? This may be more familiar to you in terms of some of our national organizations of what we would call a logic model. At the end column here, we've got, I've, I've written here themes and programs, because this is about, are you required to fit your program into a wider program, such as the Birmingham uh, Commonwealth Games Festival? So does your, where does your, your program fit? And that may be a small part in a wide, a much wider program. Are there specific themes that you tie into? And do those themes allow you to have areas, whether that's cultural excellence, participation, engagement, that you can demonstrate your activity and what you've achieved? Just going to take a breath there to get you to think about the process that you're going through in this and the process that you're going through when you put on your activity. Because I think sometimes the process, if, if you're looking for change through something, the process is just as important as the outputs and outcomes in these last few columns here. But we often miss the process. And sometimes that process of engagement with people are some of the life-changing moments that you may have in communities. Some, something as simple as putting on a festival or event may bring in people that have never, never participated before. They might volunteer for something. And again, you might not know the impact that's had on them for three to four months down the line. But the process of even being involved in putting on um, an art program or a festival, have you thought about evaluating that? Are you managing that process as well? So that gives you lots of um, areas to, to contemplate there. And, and hopefully is a good resource for you to use on that too. Again, just trying to simplify that so that it's not scary, it's just your aims, your backgrounds, what will you put in, what are you doing, who'll be involved, what will happen on the day, what are the outcomes you're aiming for, and how will you know when you achieve it. Okay, I'm going to move on to what I said we would talk, we'd spend a little bit of time on earlier, or quite a bit of time on really, in terms of understanding the social value of events and how we evaluate the social value. So in the piece of work that we did for Spirit of London 2012 and Local Trust, um, this, this was quite a, a, well, quite a big piece of work where we, we conducted an evidence review and a literature review for them, and we looked at what we meant by social value. And we came up with six themes uh, for social value. And these are the six themes here, community, participation, well-being, skills, negative values, and place. And we'd look at how you would evaluate each of those six themes, these six areas of social value. And I think that's the area that sometimes lends itself to much more qualitative evaluation. And it gives you a richness of data, I would say. These are the things that you instinctively know when you say to me something, I know instinctively this works. I know instinctively that this is really good for the community and, and it makes it a better place to live. Uh, people are engaged. It helps with their well-being. Um, at times it can have a skills development, etc. And you, you feel that you can talk about that, but can you demonstrate it? So when would you need to demonstrate it? And who asked you for that? So often with these, I say that this takes us sometimes to when we deal with politicians or um, local councillors and they say, 
the statistics are useful and we need them on the economic impact. And I need you, and I absolutely wholly need you to, to show that the, the money that's spent here has had a return on the investment. Sometimes we talk about that return, um, not just of investment in quantitative terms, so, but in the qualitative terms. And that's when you can show that the social value is much more interesting. The politicians, the councillors, they want to be able to give that meaningful data, you know, that richness in the text of what you are, you are doing as artists, because what you're doing as artists and creatives isn't always quantifiable. It's much more than that. And so by able to be justify your work and social value terms allows you the chance to explore that depth and to, to show um, the value that this is having in the community. We're starting to see this much more being written into um, government strategy. It tends to be written into things like external engagement strategies, soft power agendas for international relations, um, things like that. And uh, even in the government white paper on levelling up, for example, the levelling up strategy specifically looks at we want to increase pride in local community. Right, well, what do you mean by that? How do they how do they demonstrate the, the, whether or not increasing pride in local community is there? And surely, it's, it's that surveys have their place, but they're not the they're not the only thing there. So, if we example, if we look at that in terms of place, we want to be able to show that there's feelings of pride and attachment to local identity. If you look at things like bidding for a Commonwealth Games or a City of Culture. One of the key things that they ask you, especially in bidding for Commonwealth Games or in Olympic Games, it says that you as a host city must be able to demonstrate that the people of the city and the nation, the people of the, the host city are behind the bid. So you have to demonstrate that they're behind the bid. So that takes more than just a, a, a quantitative as well. So we tend to see on those large scale events, people justifying it by engaging artists, engaging filmmakers, engaging sports personalities and celebrities that you'll see will do these video clips and say back the bid. And so they'll be backing a bid, for example, campaign, whether that's sporting or cultural. And one of the things that they're trying to demonstrate is this will have economic um, benefits to the city. It will have increased pride to a city. It will improve the skills, it'll improve well-being, it'll improve all of these six social values that we've said here. So things like the local identity being improved, um, whether or not, for example, you're making use of public spaces and um, city squares, creating that sense of place and identity and branding that wasn't there before. Festivals and events have been good at this over the years. If you look at something like um, the rise of book festivals, for example, and so, yes, more recently through COVID, some of them went online. But things like the Wigton Book Festival have created an identity for that town through their book festival. So that town is now known, or one of the things it's known is for that book festival. Glastonbury will be known for its music festival. And how, do, how does that start? They always start small and then they grow. So these are things about pride in place. And remember, with that, with that comes some disruption as well. And some disruption is disrupting the norm, um, and that can be positive. But it can also have negative effects on things like social costs and noise and things like that. And we'll look a little bit at these um, in a bit more detail. I'd like to separate them out just slightly to help you in thinking about those six areas of social value. I've uh, put them into, these are collective impacts is what I, uh, is what we call from this. So place, participation and community are collective impacts. I'll just move myself down there a little bit and I'll see if I can minimize it. Um, Okay, never mind. Um, these are collective impacts. So we talk about the community, participation in place, all bringing an, a, a sense of identity with that. And if you look at how we would justify some of these, if you look at community, for example, there's a World Bank questionnaire, which I've got the resource for at the end for you, that will give you a, a, a toolkit and an actual questionnaire on social capital, is what it's called, the social capital in terms of networking, community of development, 
um, how how do you involve all or most members of your community? How do you help grow people's social capital where they want to participate or feel that they can participate in the cultural offering that you're putting on? How often do you hear people saying, oh, that's not for me, you know, that I, I don't think I could go to that. That's because we don't have what we sometimes call a social capital. And that works across many barriers or, or many boundaries of one of the things you're trying to do with festivals is to break down those boundaries and say whether that's everybody participating in a jam session of music to listening to opera, we can try to break down those boundaries and through music, through culture, through art, through participation, through growing that sense of community. You're hoping as well that having programmes of art and culture and festivals will lead to sustainable communities um, that will help people be resilient in times, in times of difficulty. None greater than that we've just experienced over the past couple of years of in times of COVID. It's interesting that during the time of COVID, the areas of art and culture became the most important in our communities, in our schools. We stopped stressing so much about teaching maths and English, so we still had to teach it, but we focus much more about getting people outdoors, participating in community events, listening to music, going for walks in nature, learning to know your place and your sense of community and, and growing communities together. One of the things that we'd like, I, I think, going forward from that is not to lose some of that thing, but understand how we evaluate that. And so much has come out from that, that dark period, if you like, into much more celebratory moments. And we've been able to go back and have the Birmingham Commonwealth Games 2022 and the cultural festivals and the sharing and participation that we've missed for so long. We talk of, do we build resilient communities? Um, yes, and but how do you increase participation? Some things like that are a bit more tricky. It's about creating networks, building linkages, developing that social capital. Um, you know, staging an event might increase an audience participation, but does it actually increase participation in a community beyond the show itself? So what else is happening? And that's sometimes the dilemma you have perhaps as cultural providers and artists of how do we move beyond a showcasing event to an integration of culture and celebration and, and, and sharing of identities in these areas. So often you talk, you hear of programmes of engagement and engagement strategies from that. One of the things that we looked at um, for the Spirit of 2012 work, which is looking at their legacy, you know, 10 years on, and they're still funding community programs along with local trust to develop and, and grow participation within the communities. Many of the events that we looked at that they put on um, or helped fund to, for communities to put on for themselves, empowered them to put them on, was they talked about a renewed sense of identity from a community that learning to love the place that you, you're in and, and to make that a better place and to increase the participation. So how on an individual level can we do that? Well, we can justify that on, we try to look at the people that we've involved in many groups set up volunteer committees to run events, to host community events, to get the community together. Now that can be fraught with difficulty as I can probably imagine lots of you saying, oh, we had lots of volunteers and we all have different ideas. And again, it's part of your logic model of what is it that you're trying to put on and where are we trying to go? The skills development is a really good one we talk about you can demonstrate an increase in social economy skills. Some of the places that we looked at as case studies, um, there were huge levels of poverty. People who hadn't worked, who had families who hadn't worked for three generations. So they didn't know what working was, yet suddenly he were in community groups asking them to get involved, um, to especially with something like a city of culture, but to, to get involved, to put on events in their local community, wouldn't know how to do that. They didn't have the skill set. They didn't feel they had the skill set. But by volunteering, by working together with other people, 
this could help develop social economy skills. And through that experience of volunteering, and we've heard that with many Commonwealth Games or Olympic Games, the volunteer programmes are very successful. We give people a, a skill set that they can then be used in the workplace and beyond. Um, and so that that became much more dominant, even on a small local level, from some of the things that we, we saw there. Yes, people in the local area, some, some people have a, you know, they understand the local history, the identity, the heritage of an area that, that perhaps many young people or people new to the area or, uh, that um, have joined that local area don't know. And that, but through this, you can you can have a range of skills coming together, um, intergenerational and uh, alike to, to work together, to develop what you need. And it's about that process again of, how am I developing my skills and making a chart, making a plan for that skills development and that, that sharing uh, from each of these. Some of the work that we saw that came out of, you know, UK City of Culture Birds, and you'll hear that, um, especially in places like Hull as well, who, who talked strongly about their volunteer programme here and, and the impact locally that that had made. These are all really good career skills that can be developed. I'd like to just take a little bit of time by um, moving on to thinking about well-being. This is increasingly becoming a key issue in evaluation terms. We've, if you look at things like um, New Zealand, Finland, Scotland, these are all places, um, and, UK, and UK government, all places where they are writing in well-being strategies into their external engagement strategies, into their um, performance indicators uh, for, for increasing the economy. We're not just looking at the traditional economic approaches of public sector growth in terms of, of economic outcomes. We're, we're looking at if we make if we focus on well-being and we focus on the quality of life in communities and cities and, and cities ha can attract people to stay there because the quality of life's good, then we can improve that and that will grow the economy. So it's about of taking a different approach to how, you know, public sector economics really and well-being and how we're going to grow the economy. That isn't the same for everybody, but local authorities are also taking a well-being approach from everything from health and drugs crisis to not seeing examples elsewhere of not seeing certain problems as crimes but a health crisis and once we approach them as a health issue we're able to deal with things better. We're seeing um, this as a key social value area um, within events and festivals that have been running. We're looking at how we're bringing in people and that perhaps didn't come in before and things like isolation and loneliness. These are the two key elements that I've seen across many events that are, when I've asked people to, when I've worked with them to do a logic model, they say, we want to reduce isolation. We want to increase well-being. Um, we want to improve people's mental health. These are huge asks. We have government programs that, have, you know, may or may not have achieved all of that. But yet here we're putting this on, on to, you know, that festivals and events are are going to be able to create um, uh, these are huge improvements in well-being. So how do we go about it again? Again, that's about monitoring and evaluation and looking. And sometimes, as I said, it's not just seeing that this is a short-term gain immediately after your festival, your program, that you do a survey and you say this was the results of it, because some of that is not realised for six months, a year, two years later. And those that were successful were community groups that have year, sometimes what we call hallmark events, where they happen year on year, the same event takes place locally or nationally, and they can go back and say, well, this is what we want to achieve and we want to chart that achievement. We want to chart the engagement. How do you set up? Do we want to engage certain people and how will we know when we've achieved it? In terms of the well-being, some of the some of the case studies that we looked at through the Spirits, Spirits work and local trust work was we followed specific community groups 
one in Yorkshire, for example, where they actually set themselves the goal of reducing isolation, reducing loneliness and trying to bring people in. And at the end of the, the community festival that they had on for that summer, they were able to realize that some of the people, some, some issues are basic, like they don't have transport, so they, they can't come. And if they manage to put on a minibus to bring people in more rural areas or outlying areas, because um, not every event is in a city, remember, so that that would help and people could come. Things like they managed to involve some, some members of the community through, it was things like a part, part of the festival was a dog show. It is something as small as a dog show. That, and, and people felt, well, I, I speak to people in the park by walking my dog. Maybe this wouldn't be too much out of my comfort zone. Back to that social capital. Do we have something in your event that talks to each person? Because not every event that you might put on will relate to everybody or or be something that they want to do. So by people getting involved in this dog show, that then led to some of those groups getting together and working together to put on other events. And one of the stories that came from that was it had involved some individuals who basically hadn't really been out of their house much in that past year, that they had got involved because there was the, the dog show, that that had led to something else. And the person was then campaigning for better transport links to these more rural areas, you know, a year down the line. But we wouldn't have known that if they hadn't charted the engagement with individuals all the way through that process and got us to that stage where they said, actually, we've looked and people are now going on to do their own things and, and within the community. And these were success moments. These are successful moments for the general well-being of your community, but they're also success moments for your politicians and your councillors to say, this is the value of events and festivals to us. They're not always just about the complete artistic moment of whether people have engaged just with the art, but they have much more far, far reaching benefits within communities. And they're really important. I think some of the most positive things that um, came out for me from, you know, years of working in events and festivals is, is seeing some of these of skills development of people of engagement, of well-being and the, the links back to community that makes them feel part of a community. So sometimes you will hear and see um, event organizers saying this gives a sense of community so how again this is about you charting it and having a means of charting it that might be as simple as making sure that you have a program to train volunteers that your volunteers on the day are participating in festivities whether that's a week-long festival or two week long festival that they can, they are trained to to mingle and to to speak to people and have a key set of questions that doesn't seem like a survey, sometimes what we refer to as go along interviews. So the go along interviews is just engaging with people informally through an event or a festival, but actually they're taking notes and they're writing these up afterwards. And it's about making feel, people feel comfortable in their environment rather than the intrusion of an interviewer with a clipboard saying, can I ask you the following questions? You know, you may follow up with surveys afterwards and they're important but you may have other means as well. Some of those other means may also be in terms of really, really basic. If you've got an international event and you've got a range of languages and you don't have enough people that can speak all of these different languages, I've seen things like just, you know, huge billboards, put, not billboards, but huge boards put up where they have emojis and smiley faces that everybody can relate to in social media terms. And they move these stickers on the emojis to how they're feeling and how the event made them feel. So at the end of the day, you've got this rich text um, through emojis of this meant feel, made me feel good, it made me feel welcome, it made me feel included, it made me feel I belong, gave me a sense of pride. And you can do that through emojis. and everybody can relate to that because we've got into a way of social media being able to use these to express our feelings. So again, just thinking a bit differently about your audience. I'm just also mindful of 
referring you to other models and things. So a really well-established model that has been used in the health sector um, um, and social justice sector is something called the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. And this is a survey that's used, and this is just an example of one of the wellbeing surveys within it. But this is, again, the resource for that is at the end of, of, of this webinar. And so you can see, again, these are some of the things I don't need to read all of these to you, but I'm conscious um, to make sure this is audio, audio available for everybody that it's, it says things like, I'm feeling optimistic, I'm feeling useful, I feel relaxed, um, I can deal with my problems well, I feel good about myself, I feel confident. So when you're asked to do a survey about well-being. These are the types of things that you can ask people and how that event or artistic performance has made them feel. And they're being used, as I said, increasingly more and more throughout the sector there. So just moving on to sometimes potentially a difficult one, what people see as a negative perceptions of events. The events may bring sort of antisocial behavior, they have noise, they have traffic. This happens sometimes where you've got um, urban or peri-urban areas and they, they have civic squares that have been deemed to be used for events. And so every weekend they're suddenly being used for events and that can create tensions with people who live there. Or sometimes it's waterfront areas that have been developed as artistic and cultural areas. So these are on all the time. And it's about how you manage things like noise, traffic, littering, um, for example. But they can also um, use this as disruption and protest events in a positive way. Not all, not all disruption is, is a negative. That is often so. Um, sometimes civic squares are known for that these are um, an area where we can peacefully protest. We can peacefully have cultural events and festivities that help to engage people in the community with that peaceful protest and again looking at those shorter and longer term impacts for some of that. Um, I think it's useful that you that this part also goes into your planning process that this is that you don't think oh that will be fine we'll just manage it you have to have good relationship with the planners if you're cutting off streets with the police you know with your community stewards do you have enough people stewarding how do you deal with complaints how do you deal with calming people down um, and also at events we need different zones as well so do you have a quiet zone for people sometimes that can't cope with a level of noise or are you dealing with um, you, you know, we have such a wide range of needs for people in the community. Is there a way that you're able to accommodate, in, you know, on social inclusion grounds that you're trying to accommodate everybody? But unless you plan for that, then you won't know if you've achieved it and you won't know, be able to say in terms of um, monitoring and valuing afterwards. Well, actually, it was really good because we were able to have specific zones for families or specific zones for quiet area, or we had silent disco, or we had concerts that were X, Y, and Z that you were able to cope for and allows you to address issues of diversity. And sometimes things of social inclusion that would be seen as a negative can be turned around to be a positive, whether that's at an individual level for somebody or a wider community level. And then just lastly then to conclude, um, because I talked a lot at, at you today here and with you about the, the tools for monitoring and evaluation, but also about understanding the social values. And, you know, I would finish by saying that increasingly we're moving towards social values are planned and charted as outputs and outcomes. And they're, as we've seen, they're not the same thing. And that they are just as important as the economic impact from festivals and events or from sporting events. And so just as Birmingham Cultural Festival is attached to a sporting event, we, we see that these are interlinked. To, uh, um, and this is always part of whether it's the Olympics and having a cultural Olympiad or a Commonwealth Games or a City of Culture, we have cultural festivities as part of the work that we do around these events. And, and because 
we don't just put on these events just for their sporting prowess or whatever. This is about an identity and connecting and the entertainment for the city and for the for the the global media across the world and and showcasing our culture to others so that we can then use that in international and international ways for exchange and that leads and helps with government in terms of our developing of our soft power um, attributes through art, culture um, and sport and showcases the cities that we have that in and so we're able to increase our exchange value and that so re results in perhaps more trade, results in more people exchanging or coming to study with us, for example. Cities are much more aware of this on this national level and they're trying to ensure that the events that they have, are that we can justify the monitoring and evaluation far beyond just the, the economic value, but in these social values. So, and then lastly, just to say, remember events are markers of identity. They are about our multiple identities within a, our communities and our cultural identity. It's about community engagement together, well-being and inclusion. And we have to celebrate and understand and demonstrate both our tangible and those intangible outcomes. From that, I mean the stories, the, the history of our cultures that we celebrate through that. That's all for today. I have finished with some resources here for you that will, you should be able to link on that take you to economic resources, social value resources, well-being and social capital resources. Thank you very much for staying with me for just about an hour. And um, I will be delighted to come and do a question and answer session with you later um, next month. Thank you very much.